And there's this whole debate about wearing a mask. And that's why I put the Statue of Liberty. Uh, if you look at the world, unfortunately, we are going straight up. And, and you can see the growth is not slowing down. So we're clearly far from a peak there. United States uh, was going down for a while, but you can see it's flat. And, and we're going to talk about this. 20 states now are going back up. And several of them are really concerning. Uh, for people on uh, YouTube, this is a quick review of my background. I have deep experience for the last 40 years in healthcare, especially in patient monitoring and ICU. And I'm using all the contacts in the webinar. I'm getting invited to kind of get some insights of what's happening with COVID and share actual facts so you can make your own decisions. So let's go for the update. Uh, um, I'm putting in green the good news <laughs> and in red the things we're concerned about. Um, the good news, Europe is on the mend. You're going to see pretty much all of Europe, except for a tiny bit in Germany there, is doing great. Uh, Brazil and the US are continuously fighting on a daily basis with the number one daily new cases per day, which is really unfortunate. Uh, South America, as you can see, is really taking off. They're not doing a million cases per week. Uh, India has an outbreak in Mumbai and Beijing has a new outbreak. And we'll talk more about that. Um, there's some good news on, on the therapeutic side. There's a, a drug, an existing drug that works in the ICU. We'll talk about that. It's always good to hear. And finally, we'll talk about the FDA revoking hydroxychloroquine as well as the World Health Organization. And the US will talk quite a bit of time of what's going on in all the states. Uh, there's some good news. It doesn't look like there was an increase in infection due to the protest. It looks like the increase is really due to the opening and people meeting indoors. Uh, and, uh, and we'll talk about more details there. But you can see if you look at the graphic here that South America is taking over in the growth. Unfortunately, following behind is Asia, uh, which of course is India. Uh, and North America, unfortunately, is going back upwards. Uh, Europe is doing good and Africa is trailing behind, but the data there may not be as clear. So let's go into the specific. We are really doing 150,000 new cases per day. That is astonishing. Uh, Brazil now is number two in the world. Um, uh, and the US uh, is still number one. Unfortunately, there you can see the number of new cases are clearly going upwards. Mexico uh, is basically starting to grow. Also, there's a big problem in Chile. Uh, unfortunately, a uh, high, very high mortality rate. Um, so let's go into more specific there. If you look at the number of daily cases, depending on the days, uh, the US or Brazil are number one. Brazil had 30,000 cases yesterday. The US is close to 28,000 cases today. And, and coming behind now is India in the third highest amount. And that's really a concern because these are very dense population there. And there's no way that they can do some of the slowdown of the economy like we did. Uh, Mexico, unfortunately, is also growing. Uh, so not good from a worldwide basis. You can see clearly going up and you can see what's going down as the US was trying to control it and Europe was controlling it and now it's starting to go back up on the mortality rate. So if you look at the number of daily deaths, clearly Latin America is the growth and is taking over the daily death. Uh, so let's look at some normalized cases by millions. Is that these are the number of cases uh, by week, so you have an averaging of the week. And you can see Brazil clearly on the way up. There is no slowdown in Brazil. India now is starting to really also accelerate. Chile uh, has an amazing amount of cases per million. It's the highest of the group, 234 per million, significantly high. Uh, and Iran had a second wave, which this seems to be recovering from. But look at the height of the wave. The second wave was as high as the first wave. And that's the thing we need to keep an eye on, that we don't have the same problem here. Uh, this is the heat map we have looked at in the past. Uh, very quickly there, clearly Europe is on the recovery. All the very hot red, which is the rising rate, uh, uh, is slowing down and is already going back to normal. Uh, US, it depends on the area. You're going to see it's all over the places. Uh, unfortunately, South America and Central America, most of the countries, this is the percent of GDP that's being affected. Uh, by, the, by the virus, pretty much, they're, they're taking the hit like we had uh, a month ago. And this is the bad news, Africa is growing up. Uh, so uh, let's look at lessons we may have learned. If you look at massive outbreak, both the UK and Belgium and Sweden had massive outbreak, but they basically responded very differently. And the UK, for a while, they tried to take the Swedish approach, which is we'll let the herd community happen. 
They waited several weeks, and then they finally, when they had that massive peak, politically they could no longer do that, they basically took some, some lockdown, and you can see then they controlled it. Sweden did not, and you can see they continuously start growing, uh, but, but not in an explosive manner. I think they were lucky they didn't have an explosive growth. Belgium, as you know, has one of the highest mortality rate, but they also quickly did lockdown and control it, and Austria was very effective. So the lockdown we're going to see is working. If you look at China, on the average, people have that really fast growth in two weeks. They do the lockdown and they really bring it down. The Chinese were the most effective doing that. Italy you know, had a bit of a delay until they start doing the lockdown order. From the time they did the lockdown to the peak, it's two weeks. We have to remember that. If you do the lockdown, it doesn't go down straight, straight away. You still have that two weeks incubation period there. So there's a two week delay from the time you do the order to when you basically hit the peak. Um, so this is an interesting graphic. So if you look at the R2, so this is saying that if you have a high amount of case per million, so it's normalized data, you should expect a high mortality rate per million just because the healthcare system gets overwhelmed. And, and what you see is that you really don't want to be in this area there, which means you have a high mortality for the same incidence of cases. And clearly Belgium has an issue there, but Belgium is, we, we talked about last week, is probably more accurate at reporting the mortality rate because everybody who dies in a nursing home is pretty much categorized as, as COVID. Uh, UK has a, also an extremely high uh, mortality rate for the incidence compared to other parts of, of, of the world there. So, so let's take a look at Sweden. It was the Sweden, Swedish model working. There's a big argument in the US. You can see some states really did not do the lockdown. Maybe say, we'll do the Swedish thing. You know, we'll just get everybody to have the herd immunity. And now we people like California locked everything down. So if you compare Sweden to Denmark, Finland, Norway, Czechoslovakia, all country with kind of similar size and similar population, their mortality rate was 5x higher per million. So, they agreed to do that. Now there's a huge backlash, as you can see by the population there, because they were hoping to go to from zero to 60% herd immunity, and they went from zero to 7%. So they got the worst of both worlds. They got a higher mortality rate compared to the, their neighbors, and they didn't get the protection of the immunity by having 60% of the population covered. So as a result of that, if you look at the number of tests that turned positive, we're gonna talk a lot about this. How many of the tests that you're doing are positive? Because a lot of people are saying, well, the reason uh, we're having an uptick in cases is because we do more testing. But if the amount of positive stays the same, that's not true. If you're doing more testing and there's the same amount of positive people, the percent of the people who are positive should go down. And what you see in Sweden, they were really waiting for people to be symptomatic. So 20% of the people who get tested are positive. This compared to the US, which is around 5%. Denmark, you can see very quickly, did some very high level of testing there, 10 times more uh, than Sweden, and they got to similar rate on what we are uh, in, in the US. So this is an interesting graphic. So that graphic is comparing county that stayed at home versus the one that kept their economy open. And then what happened? And, and what this is showing, and if you're interested, you can read the paper, it's, it's, a, it's a deep paper. Uh, this in orange are the country or the state that did not do a shutdown. And you can see that they really didn't have a massive slowdown as opposed to country that did down. And then you have that two week delay and then you can really see that they stopped the progression there. And so this is an interesting analysis to say, well, you know, what's happening to the progression of the disease if you do a lockdown versus, you know, uh, keeping the economy open. But then became even more interesting uh, is that it's a bit graphic is that they normalize all of that to basically compare them one against the other. And what they show is that if you do a stay at home, you do have a drastic drop. And they calculate that in the US, if the whole country, which may not have been politically acceptable, but if the whole country had shut down uh, across all the states as opposed to certain states, that the difference would have been uh, decreasing by 390,000 cases and decreasing fatality in a period of three weeks. Okay. So it's one of the first time we see an analysis of you know, what will happen if once they do this and a kind of mathematical model there. So another interesting thing that came out this week is an analysis that got published in the Lancet, which is a very prestigious UK journal. And they estimate that 22% of the world population is at risk. Um, and you can see, unfortunately, Europe was the darkest one 
where it's up to 35% of the population had some comorbidity, which may explain the significantly high mortality rate than we saw. Okay. Clearly similar things for the US. Um, this age is not why you're dying at a higher rate. It's because of the amount of pre-existing condition. And clearly the strongest one is cardiovascular. And, and then they look at the age group and they tie this by, by countries. And you can see in South America and all of that, they're starting to see some young people who have ironically some cardiovascular issues there. They're dying at a very young, young ages. There were there's 10 people in Florida today that died at the age of 40. So it's not the age we need to look at, it's the pre-existing condition. Where are things growing the fastest? Uh, US, uh, you know, you're gonna see is flattened up, but Chile has a big problem and so is Brazil and, and, and Mexico. And this is, we're gonna talk a little bit about China has an upsurge, but look at the color of Africa. And, and, and again, you know, it's, it's, it's really the big worry we had is that the virus will move to, to South America and, and, and Africa, and then, you know, it, it will grow. And we, we cannot control it there. So Beijing had an outbreak. I don't know if you have been to Beijing, but they have a, a very big market. And that market is massive. It's 277 acres, it's 2000 stalls. And it provides 70% of the vegetables and fruits to the population of Beijing. They had 180 cases. The, it, they did a mutation, they did analysis of the virus and it came from Europe. So it was probably somebody who came back to China who carried that, that European mutation. Remember we talked several weeks ago about the German mutation. So they immediately went to lockdown. Uh, 20 million people living in Beijing are in some form of lockdown. The ceiling of residential neighborhood, nobody can get through. You need to get a QR code on your phone to be able to get in and out and to justify you know, being outside your house. They tested, this is astonishing, 367,000 people in five days. There's no way we have done that in the US. I mean, the, the, their response in shutting down in a hotbed and an outbreak is really something we need to learn from uh, in the US. So, so we need to keep an eye on that. They claim it's under control, we'll see. Um, this is a very interesting analysis. It looks at the daily number of tests per 100,000, so it's normalized, and versus the positive rate. And the 5% line is kind of the average that we're seeing in the US. So on the average, um, we get 5% of the people get tested, are tested positive. Overall, the, you know, this is worldwide. Uh, in US is a little bit higher depending on the area there. Brazil, as you know, is really high. Look at Brazil. It's 36%. That's astonishing. And it probably means they don't do enough testing. Uh, but still, I mean, that's, that's really worrisome. Mexico is another big worry, 18%. It's very, very high. Sweden, they decide not to test. So whoever gets tested is somebody who has symptoms. So you would expect to be 15%. And then the US overall was at 13% uh, or, because some states are really high right now. So very interesting there. You can see that some countries like Hong Kong uh, for a while was really controlling it. And so did Iceland. Iceland, I think, tested 10% of their population there. So uh, we need to really keep an eye on this test rate because it gives us an idea, do we have a good sense of what's happening in the country there. Uh, fatality rate, we look in the past, there's no news except Mexico, straight up. And that's really unfortunate there because you know the way they're going, they're gonna pass Italy. Uh, most countries fail to capture the COVID death. And so we have to be careful when we look at data, you look at Belgium and they look at the normal mortality for this time of the year based on historical data. And that's the dotted line. And then they showed the blip due to COVID because we have reported that. And then they look at the number of people who die. You can see that's pretty much one-on-one -on -one in Belgium. And that's a mortality of 16%. You look at the UK, they're under-reporting because the true number of deaths is significantly higher than the one they report for COVID. And same for New York. Look at the difference in New York. So, so it, it, it was estimated that in the US, we're underestimated by 50%. So in other words, if there's 100,000 deaths, there's really 150,000 deaths. Uh, and the big problem is nursing home. Uh, on the average, 50% of the deaths in, in, uh, uh, in 40% uh, of the deaths in the US are nursing home, 50% in Belgium. In Belgium, they decide to basically say, you know, if you have all the symptoms there, we'll let the doctor decide if you die from COVID there. So, uh, and you can see the number of cases uh, being done there, you know, is, is not that great. So this is an interesting analysis. Uh, so they look at the age, 
And, and you can see the different part of the world have a medium age of mortality there that's much younger than us. We are like over here around 40 years old uh, and same as Europe. So high income countries, which is pretty much the US and Europe has a, high has a high medium mortality rate because most of our deaths is over the age of 65. But then what we see is that some of the Sahara countries, Asia, mortality, the medium mortality is 20 and 30 years old. And, and this is the interesting part, 50% of the person between the age of 10 to 20 of 20 years old, uh, that population there, only half of them get sick with the same exposure. So they're, they only have what's called a 50% susceptibility, but 79% of those who are positive are some asymptomatic. And that's the worry when you reopen the school is that they have no symptoms and they're gonna carry and be super spreaders. And so, so very interesting analysis there. The other one that was really surprising is that uh, over the age of 71 years old, 31% were asymptomatic. So it's still a very high number there. So, uh, so age has the same contagion rate. So they did some analysis there. They have the same, you know, R no, which is, you know, one person contaminate two and a half person if not controlled. But uh, if you're older, you have a higher susceptibility, you're more vulnerable to get sick based on the same virus exposure. Um, so what we're seeing right now as the disease is spreading to South America in, in, in Africa is a younger population dying uh, than the US. And that's probably due to the high density, high population, lack of uh, health access and all of that. So Brazil, it's really sad to watch. It's, it's straight up. Um, uh, US, you can see, was going down and now we're going back up a little bit there. India, straight up. Uh, Mexico, straight up. These are all the fast curve we have looked in the past. And we know those countries cannot do a lockdown. So unfortunately, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Peru had a really big problem there. They're trying to control it. Uh, Russia, you know, in Moscow was a big problem there. It's kind of flat a little bit on the downside. And the UK is doing great now. They're pretty much like the rest of Europe, uh, going close to back to normal. So traveling the world, you can see with countries like Bangladesh um, and in Pakistan and all Mexico, all high density in Turkey, unfortunately, uh, we have to keep an eye on that and the UK is doing good. So um, let's look a lot at the US. We have over 2.2 million cases. Today we had 20,000 cases in Florida. And the bad news this week is that a lot of the states do the highest amount of cases this week including California. Um, so um, we have around a thousand deaths per day in the US uh, from this disease. You can see the, the cases are clearly going on, on the backup phase. Um, this is good news. The, it, the early testing seems to indicate that all the people protested in the street and a lot of them were wearing masks did not increase the infection rate. And in Minnesota, they tested, you know, uh, over 12,000 protesters, uh, uh, people were in the streets. And, and the positive rate is even lower than the average in the US. So that's great news. That means people were in the street, they were close to each other, but being outdoors, having a mask, uh, you know, I think was, and maybe they were slightly younger population there. Um, so New York is doing good too. They're averaging less than 3%. So they're clearly on, under control there. Uh, nursing home is not good news. Uh, we have estimated over 51,000 people uh, who have died in nursing homes. And, and that's assuming that we have a good handle of some states. Uh, it's estimated 40% of the deaths in the US are from long-term care. Uh, and the problem is that they don't want the, the elderly to be isolated because that would create a lot of mental and behavioral concern if they're by themselves, not seeing their family and all of that. At the same time, they want to provide uh, protection there because they're so vulnerable there. But you can see uh, it's pretty much uh, everywhere uh, in the country that we, it's, it's gonna be an area that we need to protect. As we reopen, we had very different outcomes. So what's very interesting about what's going on is that uh, Denver, they reopened and you know, it didn't came back up. But Florida, you're going to see Florida, Orange County, Hillsboro, Arizona. Arizona is on an emergency healthcare alert right now because they're running out of ICU beds. So uh, it's, it, we, need, we only have to learn more about why are some states reopening and 
not having a huge uptick and other ones are not. So if you look on a per state basis, per thousand cases, Arizona is the fastest growing. Uh, California, unfortunately, uh, is also uh, growing. So is Florida, is the Southeast area there. Uh, we're doing a better job at taking care of people. Remember, there's a three weeks delay from the time you get infected to the time you may end up in the ICU, and then you have a bad outcome. So, so the, the, the new number of deaths is going down, but we have to see what's gonna happen with the uptick in the next three to four weeks. Um, so if you look at the number of cases, in dark red is 100% increases versus two weeks. 100% is a pretty big increase. And you can see, look about the whole Southeast and then the whole West Coast. The Northeast is doing fantastic. So uh, a tale of two cities, Oregon up 217%. Really concerning, we have roughly half the country that's on the uptick and then the Northeast is doing good. And it is another way to look at this, which is if you look at the positive rate Arizona is having 12% of the tests coming on positive. And they basically have a problem in the ICU utilization there. Uh, and that's why they're having some uh, healthcare issue there. So that's, that's Arizona is in trouble. Um, as I said, on the average, we're looking for that 5% benchmark uh, to kind of control the disease. And you can see there's a lot of state, you know, unfortunately, who have a high positive rate and utilization rate. Another way to look at this is to look at the three day moving average to see if it's a recent uptick. And you can see that Arizona, very hot, way up. Uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Florida, uh, uh, it's an interesting indicator. And the whole East Coast doing fantastic. Look at them. They clearly are close to go back to normal. So clearly uh, uh, the East Coast did an early shutdown probably a month before anybody else uh, uh, on the Southeast. And, they, they, they got the disease under control. Uh, the, uh, the, we have to be concerned about some of the data may not be as accurate. CDC has very tight guidelines about what you report. And we talked about a couple of weeks ago that some states are putting together the antibody test with the PCR test for seeing if you have positive uh, exposure. And so therefore, we, you know, some of the state are already under-reporting uh, some of the cases they have or uh, so, so, you know, unfortunately, we can always compare all the states. This is um, a way to look at that 5%. That's kind of the benchmark, and which is the number of tests that turn positive. That means you have a good testing system to really manage the population. Now, Puerto Rico, they don't do testing a lot. So that's why it's 100% because whoever they test is somebody who's in the hospital. But then you look at Arizona, 17%, Alabama, Washington state. South Carolina, these are massive numbers, way above the 5%. Um, and what we want to take a look at as a country is that we initially were testing people who were um, you know, very sick. That's why you see the positive rate to be so high. And then over time, now that we're doing more big populations, that you want to have a number around 4 to 5%. And, and so the fact we do more testing is good news. And, and what you want is to see these numbers to be flat or going downwards. But now you can see there's an uptick here. And, and so let's look at some specific states. Uh, Arizona uh, has right now a 17% positive rate and clearly on the upside. Texas also was kind of flat and now it's back on the upside as 9% of the case. And, and um, now let's compare this to Florida. Uh, Florida, look at this, they were really nice and low there. And in the last what, six weeks, uh, it really kind of went straight back up. Uh, and same thing for, uh, sorry, moving my slide. And same thing for Alabama is at 12% there. So, so that way you're looking, you know, as we're increasing the testing, people are saying, well, we're just doing more testing, but we're having a high positive rate. That means there is an uptick of the disease spreading for the community. If we were staying at 5%, if we do more tests, the number of people positive will go up and the percentage should stay flat, if that makes sense, okay? So, so that's concerning. Uh, New York doing fantastic, look at that, 1.1%. They, they, you know, they, they had a really big swing at the beginning there, but they really controlled it. And then California, uh, we have a blend of Northern California and Southern California, and we're averaging 4.6%. So 45% uh, of Americans have pre-existing conditions. So it's not just the old people who get this, it's where we're like, uh, pre-existing condition and it's very clear that cardiovascular and hypertension is the leading cause 
that will get you into the hospital there. And next to that is diabetes. So uh, if you look at the state heat map, it's growing. Uh, if, if you look at the video a couple of weeks ago, we had a couple of states. Now you have this list is going longer and longer. Um, and New York is doing good. You look at the heat map, you want to see the green. What you don't want is to see uh, somebody going from a, a low a little orange to dark, uh, deep color there. And you can see those, those, those states you know, are not doing good. Uh, a way to look at this, if we, if we take out New York and you look at the rest of the country without New York, you can really see the upswing. This is the dotted line here. You say we never really control the virus. And that's why you see the, the upswing there. Uh, Alabama, uh, in the last week, Alabama is kind of the leading one in some new cases. Florida is really a trouble, Texas. California, unfortunately. Uh, so, so you look at the, at the growth rate, that's the worry. The country as a whole is 1%, so you can see it's kind of flat. But look at some of these states. This is a clean uptick. So on the case by week, this is a nice graphic. If you look in the, in the blue, this is when you have two weeks of decline, which is what you want to see. So it's, it's going the right direction. Clearly you can see the Northeast, Maine, Vermont, all doing good in, in controlling it. And then you have uh, the area that we, we have been discussing, the Southeast and the West Coast, where unfortunately it's, it's going straight back up. This is concerning. Um, if you remember, I showed this four weeks ago and then we've been updating several weeks. This is the R naught. The R naught is when you are positive and you're infectious, how many people do you infect? And left untreated, the, the, the virus has a 2.5 uh, ratio, which means that you infect two and a half person. Uh, uh, if, if you're infectious. And what we want is to get an R no below one because that's how you slow the pandemic. We have gone from two states to 26 states to be above one. We, we barely had a couple of red, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and you can see the list there and I put them in descending orders. Hawaii just popped in, uh, Montana, Arizona. I mean, it's massive, it's 26, it's half the country. In a period of four weeks since we started reopening there, has basically have the, 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 the multiplication rate, you know, is going back up. So, so that's the risk we're having as we're reopening the economy is that we, we're gonna get more cases, not because we do more testing, uh, but because you clearly have a, 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 an increase in the contagious rate. Hot spots, very consistent, the whole Southeast and then part of California and a tiny bit here in the Washington, Oregon area there are the hot spot. And this is the gross rates compared to, you know, over two weeks period. So, so it's, it's a good trend indicator. Uh, some outbreaks, uh, these colors are getting darker. Uh, so you have, uh, again, not really big cities, mid-sized cities. Uh, you can take a look at that. Uh, um, and so Arizona is an issue. Um, let's look at California. Uh, as of yesterday, we had the highest number of cases per day ever. And that's why Governor Newsom decided that we should all wear masks in public. We'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, if you look at the averaging over seven days to really have a good feel for it, it's clearly up. It's not explosively uh, going upwards, but it's clearly upward trends. So uh, Imperial, which is near San Diego, uh, is has a pretty high uh, death rate per 100,000. That's the highest one. And so clearly we have a hot area there in Southern California there, Los Angeles, Kings County, Imperial Country. And then I put some of us here, San Francisco, and San Mateo are right here. And I think I have Santa Clara somewhere. Um, and so if you look at the daily desk, clearly going up and, and the case there. So, so we're, under we're not under control. And if you look at the Bay Area for people uh, on the call, and you can see Alameda is going up. Santa Clara is doing great. We have, we have an uptick, but we're still below that, that rate of less than 2.5 cases per 10,000 that we're shooting for. Marine, straight up, something going on in Marine. So if uh, some of you are in Marine, Marines, so just be careful. Um, and Contra Costa is going up. So the Bay Area, also we're much better than the Southern California. We have to keep an eye uh, as we're reopening uh, some of the, the stores. And if you look at the Latino population, uh, it's very consistent. They are the highest percentage of positive case, significantly higher than they, than they mix in the population. Uh, if we look at the hospitalization and ICU rate, the good news, we have a lot of av availability. There's a bit of an uptick in number of patients going to hospital, which is consistent with the number of cases going up. 
So good news, UCSF has tested 4,000 people in the 16 square block in the Mission District. They find out that between antibody and people were positive, it's 6% of the population, which was a little bit higher than what we had expected. People the Latino population is 96% of the new infections. And that is probably not because of racial issue, it's because they cannot work from home. So they have to be outdoor and, and are, are going to other locations there and they have a higher chance of getting exposed. They make less than $50,000 and they usually live in more crowded households. Uh, but if you look at San Francisco, 50, they have 50% infection rate versus 15% of the population. So there's a social demographics here that's even more important than aging. As of yesterday, we all have to wear masks in California uh, so that you know pretty much you have to wear masks in a public space if you are on public transportation, including Uber and taxis and stuff like that. Uh, but you can escape wearing masks if you're less than two years old, none of us qualify. Uh, or if you are swimming, walking, exercising outdoor and you can keep the six foot distance. So that's kind of uh, not a huge change, uh, but just be aware that uh, if you go shopping anywhere, you have to wear a mask indoor and outdoor. A bit of an update on coronavirus. Uh, this is a picture using a microscope, uh, a transmission electron microscope. You can see the viruses in blue attacking uh, the cells. And this is an interesting study and they look at the human cough saliva. Remember, uh, speaking has a very low amount of a virus, but if you cough, if you shout, or even if you sing, you basically have bigger particle that gets created. So if there's no wind, most of them within 10 to 15 seconds, they drop in a very short distance, you know, less than two meters, which is roughly six feet. And, and that's in a very fast amount of time. I mean, they're pretty much on the ground within 30 seconds. So just be aware of that, you know, as you're talking to people there. On the other hand, if you have wind, and we had some wind recently, recently here in 15 kilometers per hour, you can see that this goes pretty far. So, so be aware, be done wind if you can. <laughs> and if it's windy there, you know, get extra protection. Uh, so, so that was an interesting analysis there. Uh, another thing that came up this week is that airplane have, have these HEPA filters, very high quality filters. And they literally captured 99% of the virus over 0.3 microns. So it turns out that the air circulation in the air may be fine. You may still have contagious of the surface uh, on the seats, but the air is pretty safe. The problem is that a lot of buildings and cruise ships don't have these HEPA filters. And they discover in the cruise ships that they only catch 20 to 40% of the virus passing through the filter that they have in the air conditioning. So now what we're talking about is retrofitting a lot of the building with high, uh, um, uh, high filter uh, air conditioning system there and also using UV light to sterilize the ducts. Uh, also talking about doing some negative pressure room. A news that came out this week is that humidity is a factor. And that may be some of the thing we're seeing in the Southeast. The best to manage the virus is between 40 to 60% humidity there. And they are learning from uh, the infection rate that if it's too dry, the droplet drops very shortly and they, they don't go very far. And they also shrink, they get smaller. If you're never had a high immunity, somehow they, they go further apart there. So it, the addition that, that they've learned is that the immune system is much better defending itself if, it, if it's in that 40 to 60% humidity zone, okay? And so Arizona as you know, is very dry. Uh, so kind of wonder if that's one of the issues they're having in Arizona. So uh, as a result of that, entrepreneurs are coming up with a whole bunch of cool ideas on how to disinfect building. Uh, so people are developing UV lights in subway cars. You can see that, you know, in the, you, know you, may, you may shut the, 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 the subway car and then blast the whole, the whole area there. Of course, you, want, you don't want to be exposed because the UV light can damage your eyes or something you can do at night. Um, there is a new type of UV light called far UV light, which is perceived to maybe safer, has been tested on mice, and they kill 90% of the virus after eight minutes. Eight minutes is still a long time, as opposed to traditional UV light, which is maybe a couple of minutes. Uh, it's not cheap. They're, they're developing a $20,000 portal like this one. And then the idea is, that, will they put this at the entrance of every building that you go to? You know, uh, So we'll see if you can sanitize your skin uh, and that cause safety issues. And then people are experimenting with photo hydroionized particles 
that, and the Chipotle Mexican Grill is already using that in some restaurants as a way to basically, because gases is the best way to disinfect as opposed to direct light. Light has to be, have a, a direct exposure. So good news, there's gonna be a lot of cool stuff coming out uh, uh, out of a need to disinfect buildings. Uh, another thing that came up is the concept of the quarantine bubble. And the quarantine bubble is that we do need to meet and talk to people. And you know, after three months, you know, we, we're all craving to meet more people. And so what, what the scientists are recommending is that you create safe social bubble circles, friends that you trust, that underline the world trust. And New Zealand and the UK have done that. And New Zealand basically wiped out the virus very successfully there. And, and the idea behind it is that the data showed that, that 25 percent of young people between the age of 18 to 29 years old are reporting serious psychological distress from the lockdown. And, and you know, we have a lot of experience. We've seen a lot of things in our lives, so we're much more resilient. But for them, you know, it's the worst thing that ever happened to them. Um, and, and so what they've shown is that if you do this quarantine bubble, as they call it, uh, in some of these countries, they were able to delay the infection uh, by 37%, and, and they had 30% fewer infected people. So it's not as perfect as being locked down by yourself at home, but if you live alone, that's not, not bearable for months. Um, and so the rules, if you, if you want to develop these teams, is that everybody has to agree to be honest. You have to trust them that they do the right thing. You're only as good as the lowest denominator of the group. So you have to make sure you don't have a 20 year old that goes smoking marijuana behind the bushes. Um, and so, so I think, you know, think about that, you know, you know, people are starting to create this circle of trust of friends that you, you can do something with. Uh, testing, lots happening on testing, just as a quick reminder, there's two type of tests. There is the PCR, which is looking at the virus DNA to see, to see if, you have, if you have an infection that's an active infection. And then you have the ones for antibody, which looks if you have developed antibodies from an infection, but that could be 21 days after you've been infected there. Now we are also looking, uh, and the FDA did a massive U-turn in the last week because too many of these antibody had been approved without true validation. And they were like all over the map in accuracy. Nobody was trusting the data. So now they forced everybody to revalidate and giving um, data as in 10 days, otherwise they, they have to stop selling the products. Uh, there's a new type of technology called viral antigen, and that's detecting uh, if your body is creating proteins because it has been exposed to that virus. And that could be interesting because that would be a way to test it before you have symptoms. One of the problems with this virus is that a lot of people are asymptomatic and they don't know they're they're contagious. And so if we could develop tests that are easy to do, that tells you that your body is reacting to it, uh, but you don't have antibodies yet and the viral cannot detect it, that would be interesting there. So there's a lot of interesting efforts going on. Now, this is the problem. Uh, if you look at sensitivity and specificity, and so for you non-mass types, specificity means if you're negative, is this a true negative, i.e. you're not sick? Sensitivity means if you're positive, are you infected? Are you really infected, okay? And so you can see that all these different equipments are all over the map in the sensitivity and specificity. Why is that important? Because if you look at some of this data, and this is kind of heavy, but if there's a prevalence of only 5% of the disease, which is what we're seeing in the US, what it means is that when you have a test that has a sensitivity of 95% and specificity of 95%, which looks great, it means that it is the, the diagnostic value is 50% and without getting to the deep math, uh, it's not really reliable. And I think one of the thing we are working on as a country is to really improve and tighten this sensitivity and specificity so that we, when we have a low incidence of the disease, which we have right now, and we're trying to keep at 5%, you know, we can really know that if you test negative, you're truly negative as opposed to be contagious. So, uh, so you know, take a look at that. Uh, and there was an interview this week I participated with Thermo Fisher CEO. And it was interesting to get his perspective. You know, he's a guy that sells a lot of these equipment for diagnostics. And he's saying the same thing that I got from Foshi two weeks ago was that, that they expect that we're gonna get five or six vaccines. We're gonna get a multiplicity of vaccine that will work better for some people. We may have to use several of them depending what your pre-existing conditions are. He said that maybe the best case is something in the fall of this year, and that would probably be reserved to the high-risk population and the healthcare workers. Next year, uh, uh, because we have to scale up production there, uh, it could be available for the large-scale population there. 
and the FDA has to prove efficacy, and everybody's trying to decide, well, how do we how do we show efficacy? Um, so right now we need to get the test outside the centralized lab because it takes too much time and it's a capacity issue. And people are working on saliva and home collection, but none of them have been really approved yet. Um, and then everybody's talking about changing supply chain. Nobody trusts what happened, which is you could not get protective gears or drugs out of China and out of India because they locked their borders and they were keeping the drugs. And so right now people are moving the supply chain inside the US or at least inside Europe with agreement to share, to share products there. Uh, there's gonna be much more uh, investment at the private sector and the public sector in infectious disease. Hopefully we'll learn our lessons. Uh, good news, this number goes up every week, 599 therapeutics and vaccine that are being tested. Um, uh, this is an interesting reminder that this is the viral load, you know, and then this is your T cells, which is your immune system responding there. Uh, and then this is your uh, inflammation response. This is this famous cytokine response that some people have around between these seven to 10. And there's different approach uh, that we're looking for using antiviral early to stop the proliferation uh, of the virus as you get initially exposed. That doesn't work, of course, if you're in the ICU. Uh, immune booster, uh, which is a lot of effort there using existing vaccine and some new, uh, some new drugs to basically help you fight. And then if you end up in the hospitals and in, 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 in trouble, all these anti-inflammatory, anticoagulant, because so many people uh, get these blood clots and, and with, you know, which puts you at risk of stroke and, and, and heart attacks. So this is for the fun. Uh, this tells you all the trials that's going on and what's the expected forecast is. So the good news, it's really busy. Uh, We're roughly around here right now. And you can see that uh, the private industry has really stepped up. There's a lot of trials and milestones and people are moving at speeds we've never seen before. Uh, to give you an idea of the trackers uh, of the vaccine, uh, most of the vaccine will require multiple doses, so multiple injections. Like uh, Moderna will require an injection 28 days apart, which means you may not build immunity for a while. So that's something we need to keep an eye on. Uh, this is the big risk. This platform using what's called mRNA, and mRNA is this new technology there where you fool your, uh, your human system build antibodies as opposed to be the traditional vaccine when you get exposed to weak vaccine or, or uh, a vaccine that's, that's non-infection. And we have never built this into a high volume uh, vaccine that has ever been used. So these are new technology that are validated. So that's kind of the risk. These are the, uh, a lot of the drugs were the first one coming out of the gate. And so uh, but the good news, you can see they're starting to move from phase one, basic safety, so, uh, so just be aware that they all have different risk. They all have different stages. And we, we, you know, we, we're not shooting for one vaccine. We're going, to, we're going to shooting for a family of five to six vaccines that hopefully works. Quickly update, Sinovac, which is a, China, a Chinese vaccine. Uh, they're moving really fast. Um, they are basically inducing what's called the neutralizing antibodies. That's the key word you need to keep an eye on because not every antibody reacts to this virus. And what the problem we have, we have discovered is that people are recovered our survivors, as we call it, and we do the analysis of the antibodies, not all of them have these neutralizing antibodies. So we're trying to create these antibodies and you do two doses and they're now starting to you know, be done in Brazil because it's so hot there. And so they're moving really fast. This is a Chinese. Regeneron uh, is, and, and then there's a big issue uh, you're gonna see in, in the news in the next several months about who's gonna get access to this. And it's a huge political battle going on right now. Uh, the European Commission has put together $2 billion to buy multiple vaccines from several companies there. It was an agreement within Europe to, to, to distribute it within Europe. Uh, the US is doing its own deal without agreeing to, to, to share with other partners. And overall, there's a concern that, you know, maybe rich country like us will get access to these early vaccines, but country with low income, where the virus can continue to spread and come back with airplanes, uh, may not have access to the vaccine. So that you may, for, we have to keep in mind that from a political point of view in the next 12 to 24 months. Um, lots of vaccine, uh, you know, all of them are of protein types and then the RNA that we talked about there, which has never been built as most of the efforts because it can move so quickly there. Uh, this is another way to look about there's a, a hordes of vaccine from very big pharma company who know to do vaccine in massive doses. Uh, and then a lot of these are kind of new technology there. And you see this Canadian company, BioNTech, is teaming up with Pfizer. 
and, and Oxford University, which was in the news a few weeks ago, and I teamed up with AstraZeneca, and they've made a contract with the US and the, and the EU. Uh, Moderna is progressing in the US. This is a company uh, that got $500 million from the government, <coughs> publicly traded, and uh, they're doing their 30,000 phase three protocol that's just been approved by the FDA. They're going to start in July. They're building a capacity to do $500 million dose per year. That means that's just the US, because remember, it's a du dual injections. So we need two injections per person. Um, and they're planning to enroll healthy patients there and then different age groups to see you know, uh, uh, how it's going to work. So we need to keep an, on that. We should get data probably in the coming months. A uh, lot of treatment in, uh, in trials, antibodies, everybody's trying every antibodies, antivirals. Um, uh, basically the idea is that if you look at the virus, we try to stop the attachment of the spike into the cell. And if you remember, ACE2 is the entry point we have identified. So we're using a lot of the existing uh, ACE2 drugs to see if we can stop the attachment there, or at least uh, do it in such a way the immune system can keep control of the pipeline is working with that ACE2 attachment. So uh, I want to emphasize the fact that there's something going on with this happy hypoxia. Uh, what we have discovered is that when we put everybody on ventilators, we unfortunately had an 88% mortality rate in New York. We now have learned that we should put people on high fluent uh, uh, nasal cannula or face mask or even helmet, which has the problem is that the airflow goes the wrong way, but people have a significantly higher survival rate by a huge factor. Now we just discovered this week, there is a, there's a drug that's cheap and available called uh, dexamethasone, which is a steroid, <clears throat> which is very cheap. If you are in the ICU on oxygen, it works. Uh, it doesn't, has been shown to be helping you before you end up on oxygen. So it's not something you can use for 80% of the people who don't end up in a the hospital there. But the drop in mortality is pretty significant and it's a cheap drug, uh, you know, and, and of course uh, the studies is gonna be released but it got pre-published. So, so the good news is that the, the, the British are doing an incredible job uh, in their hospitals at testing all the existing drugs very quickly there on thousands of people and identify existing drugs that are available low cost that you know are, are decreasing up so so that's kind of the good news um hydroxychloroquine is finally dead uh, both the fda revoked it and today the world health organization stopped all the trials to says you know it's unethical to use the drug so it's it's over please don't take it um uh, the spanish flu lessons to be learned here very interesting so they look in 1918 and the city in red are a city that where we get forcing distancing and wearing masks and all the things. So it's kind of some of the thing we see in the Southeast. And the city is in green, we're forcing the distancing and the lockdown. So kind of lessons learned from 1918. And what's interesting, there was this assumption that if you don't do the lockdown, your economy will recover faster because you don't shut down the economy. And they show exactly the opposite, is that the, the cities, uh, that did a lockdown and force, you know, stricter measure had a faster recovery than the city where people were sick, lo were sick or longer. So ironically, I mean, this whole debate we're having in the U.S. about, you know, we, we cannot do the lockdown because we don't want to affect the economy. But the learning in 1918 is that, you know, it was exactly the reverse. And we had the same situation there where the virus hit the East Coast first and the West Coast was able to learn from the East Coast damage and therefore they took stronger and faster measures. So they had a faster rebound. So you can see the whole West Coast here had a much faster recovery with less mortality than, than some of the East Coast that took the first hit. So very similar pattern here. Uh, so uh, worth reading. Uh, as you know, we've hit $20 million of unemployment uh, benefit that have been claimed uh, to give a perspective um, you know, this is weeks into recession versus the past. I mean, this is something we've never lived for. Uh, the stock market as a result of that is doing a lot of volatility. Uh, and so we'll see where that goes. And, uh, and this is my last slide. I'm still trying to be optimistic. We will find a way to beat this. Uh, 